be to this mic. Um, it's an honor and a real pleasure to be invited to speak at the AA. Um, I think when I first came to London in uh, nine, uh, 89, all the offices I wanted to work in were actually AA grads or AA tutors. So um, it's, it's really nice to be invited here to speak about the work. Um, I think probably the title of the lecture, I hope, will speak for itself as I kind of go through the projects. But in a way, the title is in opposition to the idea of data mining, which is a, you know, very topical and relevant. But what we're about and what um, we try to do with the work at ABA is um, kind of discover identity rather than um, assembling data and with the work as the kind of vehicle and also the catalyst for creating an urban culture or suburban culture um, through identity and um, architecture as an instrument. <laughs> um, I also want this lecture to be a tribute to everybody in the office. It's not just me um, coming up with all the work. It's a collective effort and so I was thinking it's lucky I'm not Norman Foster. There'd be 200 or 550 <laughs> people up there, and it'd be really hard to find. Um, but um, yeah, the the work is collective, and it's also um, I think a lot of the projects, the personalities, and input of people in the office really does come through. So I don't really like lists, and I don't like um, the sometimes pretentious nature of trying to sort of analyze um, what we're doing and describe it as a list. But I think the, these three um, things, qualities, devices, and intentions, are a, a summary, in a way, of some of the, um, the kind of theses that we pursue and some of the um, most important qualities which can uh, list. I mean, the abnormal, I think, is really interesting. Just the um, challenge of questioning what is normative and what is normal and, and why um, and how convention kind of inform what we do. And we aim to always kind of challenge those conventions. Um, sensuality, reaching the senses that architecture normally doesn't reach. Materiality and immateriality, w we explore both in equal measure. Um, we're interested in how architecture can be immaterial, but sometimes we do that through um, a really intensive exploration of, of specific materials and elements. Site specificity, illusion, a kind of Baroque device that I think is really neglected and um, is really useful and powerful in architecture. Devices, actually, that list could be about 50, 50 words longer, but some of the um, common themes that uh, apply to the work, cross-breeding, folding, wrapping, peeling, and slicing. In a way, I'm, I like the way these words are verbs because the work we do is, I think, always in process. We don't see the work as a kind of final final solution, but it's, it's a kind of capturing of a of a moment in a process. And the intentions, um, these are kind of hybrid <laughs> words, but I think a lot of what we do is about transforming typologies. And maybe what we're creating is something that could be called hybrid typologies, um, that the work we do is a, often a byproduct of a process. We try not to des over design things. and. Um, solutions emerge from a process. A loose fit, that's about sort of buildings that are maybe start out as being housing or start out as being office buildings or something like that, but um, and are particular in their response, but they become um, generic, we hope. They can be used um, in other ways and become part of the infrastructure of the city or cultural infrastructure. So. 
I mean, that's all a bit wordy, but it's, <laughs> I, I suppose, um, just an introduction, and these things will uh, hope emerge through the work. This is just a, a map of um, the UK and some of the projects that we're doing, sort of sprinkled around um, the UK. A lot of s work in seaside towns. And this slide I show because I think um, Rachel White, Weed's house, which was a really powerful um, kind of synopsis, I think, of the the um, uh, kind of ominous sense of containment and enclosure, um, how our lives are are defined by these incredibly restrictive boundaries, and and um, Ra Rachel White Weed expresses this through this casting of the inside of a house, and um, in a way, this project which was one of the first competitions um, ABA did, which was for Concept House 99, when we came second, is very much in, in response to that idea of, of taking a, a typology, such as the Victorian uh, terraced house, and, and kind of morphing it um, physically and programmatically so that it becomes a much looser fit um, and the the spaces within the house I describe as breathe, start to breathe. Um, courtyard, it's kind of a, a hybrid of a courtyard house and a terraced house and um, a kind of organic sensibility. And these um, themes kind of emerge and re-emerge in the work we're doing. We don't really, uh, I was saying to Michael, we don't really um, do houses anymore, although we have about five on the go in the office, and I, um, it's hard to sort of refuse them when people call, because I've sort of come to realize that houses are really an opportunity to um, experiment, and each one is a kind of thesis in a way, and although they're incredibly labor-intensive, um, sorry, this is a, a house up outside of Derby, it's um, it's just about to go in. It's at the very early stages, sort of um, pre-planning submission. It's going to be a PPS seven house, and it's a a kind of transformation or reinterpretation of a courtyard house. The client has a steel fabrication factory and, and is going to um, f uh, do all the cladding in Corten steel. This is a house in Canterbury. It's an extension um, and kind of gutting of a house, and, and this is, in a way, an offspring of some of our earlier projects, such as the Salt House and the Wrap House. Hyde House is um, a project that was commissioned by Landmark Estates. It's, um, it's, again, a kind of experimental house. We and seven other architects were asked to design landmark houses in this water park, Cotswolds Water Park, which is down here on the left. Um, and this house um, also kind of inspired by or refers to James Terrell's work and um, the idea of framing very specific views of the landscape within kind of trapezoidal openings. And the whole house is basically formed of, of um, trapezoidal frames that either are um, negative or positive protrusions or um, into the landscape, and it's also a courtyard house. Mirror polished stainless steel and mirrored glass kind of play with the ideas of illusion reflecting the landscape and kind of capturing it within the house. It's also a kind of barn. It's got a barn-like space in it, so it's a, it's a very hybrid project. <coughs> and I'll, so I'll, um, I'll try to go kind of quickly through some of the projects, earlier projects, which are built, but just um, to give a little bit more insight into what you don't get from the website. But uh, the VXO house, um, I just like to make the point that this project started as um, a bookshelf. The client called me up after they had a fire in their house and said, would we like to design a, a bookshelf for their study? <laughs> and it turned into a um, sort of two-year-long, really big project and ended up in the Fiden Atlas of <laughs> Contemporary Architecture. So you can't ever underestimate the scope um, and potential of a, of a phone call from a sort of unattractive-sounding project. 
<coughs> so on the left is the was the existing house, and on the right was is the kind of series of three, the extent the expansion of the house, uh, pavilion, gymnasium in the garden, and a carport. Um, three projects done over a period of um, sort of two to three years, and it's very much a play on the kind of 60s uh, language, the modernist um, kind of paradigm of sort of clean elements, expressive structure, the foyer as a canvas for events such as the V column which holds up the whole front extension, a site-specific piece of um, art by Simon Patterson called Ohm Sweet Ohm, and uh, a suspended hanging stair. Um, this this wall drawing by Simon Patterson is also, um, there's a door in it that leads to the, um, the toilet, basically, at the front of the house. And so it's kind of ironic that you walk through a, a sort of piece of art to the washroom. But Simon Patterson's work has this um, humor and this narrative quality that um, I think works really well in its context. The suspended stair, it's, it's hanging from eight bolts on either side of um, the mesh, which is stainless steel mesh, which is um, walkway, normally used as walkway grating. And we s more or less gutted the house, introduced double height spaces. And um, as that project was under construction, we um, were asked to design a gym in the garden, which was conceived as basically um, a series of landscape elements um, a concrete plinth, which is a retaining wall, a timber deck, and the the garden sort of elevated and held up, um, held up above the walls with anthropomorphic columns. Wi as we'd done a kind of V, we felt we had to work in context with our structural expression, and so the X's became the the structure for the gymnasium. The wall at the back is is a retaining wall that's clad with pebbles, sort of hand individually laid into the um, in situ concrete and rendered wall. And then finally, the um, I think my favorite element of this project, the carport, which is kind of a timber deck, some picture frames that the cars drive through, and then an O, which cantilevers um, well holds the cantilevered end of the of the roof, so it's the most sort of implausible letter that could act as a major piece of structure. And what's kind of interesting is that along with our re um, sort of pledge to never do any more work on houses, the clients have asked us to do an extension to the roof um, and have a study up there. And, and so we've kind of, we can't refuse, we can't have somebody else working on this project, so we have a a Y roof study ha happening on the top floor. Um, the next project, Fold House, this hasn't really been published very much, but because it's another project that when uh, it was finished, I was sort of embarrassed that, we'd been that we were still doing house extensions, and so I didn't want anybody to see it. And then um, it, um, it finally was published in, I guess, Architectural Review, and I had really uh, hugely positive feedback from it. And it, it is the kind of beginning of a lot of the work that we're doing, um, or the kind of experiments that we're doing. It's an extension, obviously, the L-shaped extension at the back of the house. And, and the idea was to, uh, a very simple idea, to take a single flat surface and through a series of cuts and folds, to create an enclosure that becomes a kind of multifunctional device. The, the folds of the surface become a sunshade. There are structural um, columns, benches. And um, we ended up making this in brass, three millimeter thick brass sheets that would express, um, well, enable us to express this really thin quality of the skin kind of peeling away from the from the enclosure, and so you can see the sort of 20 mil by 40 mil steel columns, which are then clad in, in brass, <coughs> which is patinated, um, but it is a natural finish, so the, the patination actually changes color depending on the humidity and the heat. And just the, um, again, 
working with illusion, we, we kind of disguise the thickness of our roof structure with mirror polished stainless steel. And this enables us to have kind of two structural systems, one that's thin and one that's deep to accommodate um, insulation and um, structural depth. And uh, I guess the principle of, of making this extremely thin and attenuated surface was to really dematerialize the, the extension. We didn't want to compete with the existing Victorian house and so it's, it was meant to rest very lightly both against the house and in the landscape and at the same time act as a, as a framing device to the garden. And that's um, that project which in a way leads on to the wrap house which is a is a extension of that, um, well, it's a house extension. Again, it's something that I sort of conceded to do at a dinner party f um, for a friend of a friend who sort of found out somehow that I was an architect and could we replace their conservatory? And I sort of thought, oh my God, we really don't want to do another <laughs> house extension. Um, and this has become a very important project for the office, winning the Stephen Lawrence Prize. So. It's um, it's a site in Chiswick that was the existing conservatory, a, a kind of um, quite eclectic Edwardian house, and the classic um, kind of brief of extending at the back with a new um, living space, and these diagrams show the oops, sorry the kind of process that um, we went through. I think it's yeah, it's thinking about sticking to the right slide. But anyway, we started with the uh, the top diagram, just this, the glass box that is the kind of expected solution, the modernist um, <laughs> box at the back of the house. And then we started to deflect the plane, the incline of the roof to open up towards the trees. And then by d the third diagram down, dividing the space kind of laterally, um, trying to create different qualities of space under one surface. And then the diagram on the bottom, which shows the plan deflecting and the roof ref deflecting. And so the two geometries of the of the of um, each end and the front and the back of the roof creating this kind of um, roof landscape, which was also part of the brief of the client that they wanted to look down on the roof and it to be a part of the, the garden. So these were the images that were more or less sold to the client and we then embarked on a very painful process of figuring out precisely the geometry of, of the roof and having to look at it upside down and on top and extracting the Im information um, for the working drawings and the whole thing took a really long time and was really tough, but we made it <laughs> um, with the help of brilliant structural engineers such as David Akira, <coughs> who I always plug in my lectures. Um, and I these are the steel framing. We had a fantastic contractor. Um, John Stidworthy, who's uh, even more of a perfectionist than we were, which is really hard to find in a, in a contractor. And so <coughs> the finished building, um, again, an, is um, kind of developing these ideas of, of um, kind of continuity, a single surface that performs many functions and is exploring a kind of other system of geometry to achieve um, many things such as the roof as a landscape and then the interior as a compressed space at one end, the slide on the left, and which then lifts and twists to become a very open space. The fireplace acts as the kind of pivotal point of the structure. Basically all the structure comes down into the fireplace and as you can see from the slide on the left, um, image on the left, the, the roof light is, well, the roof is not connected structurally back to the house. Um, at the same time, more or less as the wrap house, we were doing the salt house in Essex, which is on the site of um, the little flat roofed 60s house. Who's 
don't have a pointer. There, uh, there. <laughs> um, a client who lives in is it working in Highbury invited a few um, architects to sort of do a little competition for this. There, oops, keeps it there. <laughs> There's the site um, for this house in Essex, which is on the um, Malden Estuary, the Blackwater um, Estuary, and it's a we were really fortunate to have this kind of terrace of 19th century oyster cottages um, immediately to the left um, on the site. So there was a kind of frame of reference and a large communal garden and just a completely eclectic mix in, in the rest of um, St. Lawrence Bay. But these are the um, oyster terraces, which are white, uh, well, they're timber clapboard and um, most using the, well, it's the kind of typology of the hipped roof oyster cottage. And we sort of took it on ourselves um, to explore this typology. I'm not really that interested uh, inherently in hipped roofs, but we thought took it on as a kind of challenge to um, work with a, a roof form that is really strictly defined through its geometry and then distort it um, basically to create a house which is in itself a bay window rather than a, a house with a bay window um, on the front. The bay window becomes the house and which allows 180 degree views up and down the coast. And these diagrams show how this kind of morphing process of the, the hipped roof takes place to create a house which is has a, a kind of south-facing courtyard on one side and is a kind of uh, device for having fantastic 180-degree views <laughs> up and down the coast. Um, and so the plan, although it, it is a fairly simple transformation geometrically, um, gave us an incredible variety of sort of sections through the house just through the kind of automatic distortion you get when you sort of change the profile of the front of the house. And we s embarked on a long process of exploring the um, how to kind of achieve this continuity and wrapping of spaces both within the house and um, on the exterior. And so the, the plan is kind of, again, a byproduct of that distortion, of that typology. We didn't really design these, these angles. We created recessed and covered areas um, that worked with the uh, hip roof geometry. And, and this is the kind of resulting plan, which is a very open plan house. Um, and one of the major elements of the brief was that it's um, open, first floor to uh, ground floor. These are an example of the working drawing plans. We don't make life easy for ourselves, and I just thought this kind of expresses just one step along the way to achieving something th that looks relatively simple. Um, and so this is the... It Again, it's a kind of two-sided house. It hasn't really got a front and a back. It has two fronts. Slide's not changing, sorry. Um, uh, and we tried to... Um, we wanted the project to be clad completely in, in black slate, but the client sort of chickened out and um, forced us to clad it in timber, which was no bad thing. This is the the kind of pr construction process, the steel frame, it's elevated above the ground as it's in a flood plain, and the timber infill, which was really fantastic and kind of a shame to cover it up, as architects usually say. Um, <coughs> it's not changing the slide. Did we copy this PowerPoint onto the... It is. It's because it's really slow. Oh, right, okay. Well, those were some quick views. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there's, um, that's the sort of entrance courtyard with the outrigger, which is a family room. Sorry, this is really bad. The um, interior, the sort of sunken living room, which is open plan. The stair, which is a continuation of the, the kind of folding geometry of the balustrade. Um, and the view up to the atrium roof 
basically where there's normally a chimney in these kinds of houses, we have a double height space and a, and a roof light. And this is a kind of visual connection from the first floor to the ground floor. And, and then just the ability, well, the geometry of the facade, which sort of works with the, um, with the neighboring houses in making this facade a kind of place that can be inhabited and that you can really engage with the landscape. And this is the house finally in its context overlooking the black water. Um, the next project is less about a, a kind of manipulation of form and more about um, surface and material. This is working for a developer, so it's quite a different thing than working for a private client. It's two houses at the back of a bull's um, bowling green in London. And they're sort of L-shaped houses, um, quite big, with double height, entrance, atrium space, a lot of the things that we um, work with in all of our residential projects. So it's not changing. <laughs> I don't know how many times I can press it. Anyway. Um, there it goes. <laughs> That's so th in this project, the um, idea was to use two surfaces, one masonry material and timber, and by sort of interlocking them, if I go back, um, where these two materials come together to create, um, well, the remaining spaces are double height spaces or openings onto the onto the garden. The stair, which is a kind of solid block that's split apart, so you walk up the stair in the kind of slice between the steps, and then um, the idea of using herringbone as a pattern for the timber cladding, which was basically taking what's conventionally used as a flooring material and sort of extending it out to the exterior and wrapping the house and so it's I mean slightly tongue-in-cheek but also it it's a way of kind of marking this place which is in the midst of a really conventional Victorian neighborhood but what's quite interesting is just the pattern although it's a flat surface it um, the whole house reads starts to read as a folding surface a kind of accordion um, although it's two-dimensional. So here we're kind of working within the constraints of a developer brief, but kind of playing with the, the, um, the kind of surface expression. So all of these houses have, have kind of gave us the basis um, we to be invited, in a way, into larger scale housing projects. Accordia in Cambridge, this, um, we were invited by Field and Clegg Bradley to participate in a 400 unit master plan. Um, that was the existing site covered with government blocks. And Field and Clegg Bradley's master plan concept, which was urban rugs on a carpet of landscape. So the idea was to have very dense um, kind of mats of terraced and courtyard housing um, quite tightly packed to allow the um, existing landscape and mature trees sort of breathing space. At first, we, I thought this was a kind of ultra-conventional master plan and was really limiting, but um, now that it's built and um, it has won loads of awards um, for Field and Clegg Bradley and the whole team, it really actually um, kind of uh, overturned my initial criticisms. The discipline and the rigor of the master plan is a really great thing and the al also the limitations of materials. We were kind of allocated or uh, negotiated three sites in the master plan, the two um, two pairs of semi-detached houses on Brooklyn's Avenue at the front, um, a 10-flat apartment building in the middle of the site, and a 21-flat apartment building along um, Hobson's Brook. The first phase of this project is complete. It, the whole thing isn't... Um, finished yet. But our first project, um, well this scheme is in a way a transformation of the Georgian terraced house. Um, what we saw as an opportunity because of the limitations of the volume, 
um, in terms of its form, we thought we would really explore the section and kind of break the house um, or free the section of the house. And so it's, it's four stories at the front and three at the back and connected by a split level stair. And in this way, you get one and a half story high spaces facing south and a really great um, family room on the top floor and a kind of double reading of the house. It's quite restrained and, and sort of Georgian looking at the front and then the house kind of melts at the back and um, as the roof line drops. And so we were working within a palette of materials um, sort of uh, from the master plan, the Cambridge brick and a kind of playful um, manipulation of windows on the Brooklyn's Avenue facade and then a much more generous glazed and um, shaded rear elevation that expresses the double height spaces within. These photographs haven't been published yet so everybody here is getting a sneak preview of the <laughs> interior of the house. Um, the living room, double height space and the dining room which opens up to a kind of two and a half story high atrium. The stair which when you're going up and down the stair you um, have glances into all the living spaces and then the family room up on the top floor. So I, you can probably see this, is, this isn't this is social housing. Um, we really uh, would like to get our hands on some kind of low cost and affordable housing and, and we are doing competitions at the moment that involve a lot of that. But in this scheme we were doing basically high-end stuff for for countryside properties. ABO2 was our 10 flat apartment building, a completely different type in the middle of the site, which was an opportunity to do kind of point building. Um, it's, it's the site surrounded by trees on all three, or uh, on three sides. And so we wanted this building to be a kind of, sort of like an apparition in the trees, uh, a kind of constantly changing um, object and so it basically went through a process of a, of a kind of very simple block and then um, by pulling the facades back or forward creating balconies within the volume of the building and this kind of emerged in um, as a basically an exercise in taking a simple skin cutting it and folding it and pushing pushing the skin in and out to create um, a quite three-dimensional form, although it's a, it's a repeating plan. This is also clad, going to be clad in brass. Um, so, and these images are kind of studying, again, you familiar uh, from the Salt House images, this idea of sort of inhabiting this space between the interior of, of the building inhabiting the kind of thickness or three-dimensionality of the facade. And this, this kind of expresses the, the way the building will change depending on um, where the sun is, the time of day. And then the third building, these two, these two apartment buildings are going on site right now. Um, although the site's been sold to another developer, they're building them according to the planning consent. And this is a kind of lesson, this building, because it was a kind of classic attempt to have um, a building which is composed of interlocking, interlocking flats of different configurations so that everyone has a double height space and through <laughs> ventilation. And it is this kind of fascinating puzzle um, which then has to be rationalized into a building that works, which is really, really difficult. Um, but we got it to work, and it, again, this building is also about sort of expressing individuality of the flats, rooms which extend to the outside. But um, unfortunately, the developers have changed it into a block of, of single height flats, and the kind of ambitions of the program um, and of the flats individually and the type have been kind of lost. So it's a, it's a kind of lesson in, in how far you can push uh, a kind of house builder in sort of attempting to uh, create new typologies. This next project is something we're just at the very early stages 
at. We um, won a competition for a, a site with 68 units of housing at South Chase in Newhall. And this is kind of our, our first really suburban challenge. It's, it's a developer who, or a landowner who wants to create a new kind of urban um, agglomeration in a way in the countryside. And it, a lot of the site's been developed already with a lot of different architects, such as Proctor Matthews and PCKO. And we were invited to um, look at this site in the bottom right-hand corner. And we kind of are looking, we're looking at local typologies such as the Essex Barn and somehow trying to attempt a, a kind of um, hybrid of, of a kind of barn typology and a kind of simple repeating kind of totemic form such as the Brancusi um, totem, which seems like a kind of odd pairing, but uh, these are the, the sort of references that we, we draw on. So we had to develop um, apartment building typologies and terrace houses, and again, this, the challenge was to kind of bring the ambitions of our, of our single houses into um, basically mass housing and a lot of repetition, and using the repetition to develop patterns that are based on, on manipulating the form, the facades of the house so that people um, are able to look up and down the street. A again, the, the kind of idea of the house as, as a bay window. And um, basically we developed six, five or six different typologies, but they were all intended to act as, as kind of um, continuations of each other in a sense that, that a terrace um, becomes the starting point of an apartment building which terminates a street and sort of defining a character uh, for this this new town in a way that is specific to Essex, um, yet has a kind of density and quality that is is really distinct. And these are the apartment building types. Um, so that project is just starting. We're working with Galliford Try on on that site and actually developing uh, patio house types in central Milton Keynes. Well, these are actually two, the next two uh, projects I'm going to show are their competitions for um, English partnership sites in Milton Keynes. And I, tr I tend not to show slides of competitions that we d haven't found out yet, whether we've won or not, because I think it's kind of bad karma. So I really hope that, <laughs> that uh, it's not going to affect <laughs> the outcome that I'm showing you these competitions tonight, but I sort of thought, basically when, the ti when I was invited to do the lecture, I thought we'd know by now, we we're supposed to find out on January the 15th, and we're still in suspense, but I mean, Milton Keynes is a real challenge. It's, it's a kind of utopian new town. Um, I could give a whole lecture about Milton Keynes, but I'm going to have to do <laughs> something in six slides. Basically, this, uh, they're trying to densify Milton Keynes and add about, f I don't know, 50,000 or uh, <coughs> just thousands of units of housing and densifying the whole, the whole um, city. And Rick Mather architects were asked to do a master plan of this, um, this whole lot, which is called, oops, Milton Keynes West One. Or central Milton Keynes. I should say that this this competition was um, we were shortlisted with Rick Mather and HTA Architects, who um, again invited us to join in the shortlisting process with them, and so it's it's very similar to Accordia, but um, bigger. We each were allocated 200 units of housing and mixed use retail leisure and commercial space. So it's kind of a jump up in scale from Accordia. Um, hmm. 
It's okay. It's kind of a big PowerPoint. Um, yeah, further down here. <coughs> Is this an old laptop? <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know if this is a good omen or a bad omen that it crashed <laughs> on, on Central Milton Keynes. Uh-oh, maybe we should skip it. <laughs> Time is it? It's twenty past seven. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. Okay. Maybe go to that slide. Yeah. Oh, I didn't get it in order. Oops. Uh oh, it went back to the beginning. If you just double go down and double click on that slide. Here, just double click on that one. <coughs> uh, actually, that one there. Okay. I think we can go. Let's see what happens. Hmm? Yeah. Um, I think the problem is here. Maybe this should be internet. The, the really exciting part is coming, so <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't, don't give up. <coughs> Ten. Yeah. Ten years. Um. Yeah. I think
think it would be better not to go really huge in a way. It's, it's what's better is to stay small and pick the projects that you want to work on be and have the kind of luxury of being selective. Yeah, it's not able to say no. I think that's an awful lot of speculation. You know, you know Norman, Norman never says no. <laughs> um, hmm, Fred, should I go talk about something else? <laughs> should I, maybe I'll try again. <laughs> Oh, you don't think I should try again? Should we go? Just the public place I'll just try and open that one up. I mean, I'm, I'm make loading up all the images right to the end. Oh, yeah. So maybe if, um, if, if they're all loaded up, then I can go back. <coughs> Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's like way to the <laughs> last one. <now. laughs> Thank you. 
Mindful of me, I talk much faster than that. <laughs> My sister was dying to speak to me, and then we got a call. Oh, here we are. I was reading through the paper, and I should make sure that it didn't. I think it's here. Oh, no. Sorry about that, <laughs> everybody. Um, okay, central Milton Keynes. In, what's interesting about working in Milton Keynes is that, um, um, is well, two things, the idea of scale and density. Uh, basically, the whole place is really kind of designed at a superhuman scale. It's des it was designed for cars more than people and it's uh, really dominated by the grid, uh, this 100 meter square grid that the whole uh, center of the city is laid out on. And so you have this kind of ubiquitous quality of the place where on, on each 100 square meter block there's one really big office building or one type of suburban house. And so what English partnerships are trying to do is, is um, densify it and bring a sort of urban scale and intensity to the place. And so with our um, team we of HTA architects, Rick Mather architects and ourselves were shortlisted for this site, Central Milton Keene West 1, and our buildings are um, the ones highlighted in green. We sort of divided up the site into 200 units and retail per architect and and tried to sort of mix the location to create um, what are called character areas on the on the master plan and um, and basically address this issue of scale because even the, the master plan has 100 meter long blocks and um, we really felt that this scale needed to be um, eroded somehow and to try to bring a kind of texture and um, variety to the streetscape, we had to just consider how to basically um, deform our buildings in a way so you would have a play of light and shadow and could work with different materials 
on different facades to get the kind of rhythm um, and richness of a kind of naturally evolving city texture. Now, what I'm saying doesn't necessarily go with this one slide because this is just the evolution of one of our buildings, but it shows the process of sort of starting with a 120 meter long slab in the top left hand corner and um, again the device of a kind of subtle folding of that long bar to introduce um, shade and shadow and allow views kind of um, um, oblique views up and down the street rather than directly across and then kind of manipulating this into a kind of sloping and stepping form that finally is, is kind of lifting off the ground to e expose the retail and commercial levels. Um, this is a, a, an image produced by Squint Opera, I believe, um, who were sort of outside 3D modeling company brought in to sort of add to our shots. But what this um, does is kind of express, I mean, it is a fairly simple approach. It's, a c it's for developer places for people. And it, it is a kind of exercise in, in both kind of modulating the form and then applying a pattern that works for the, um, the kind of housing layout inside. There were really strict requirements um, as to the kind of mix and number of units. But I mean, in a way, we're working in a void in Milton Keynes. There's no kind of local culture. There's no context other than sort of quite bad 70s curtain walling um, projects. And so we, um, as a group, the three architects agreed to work with stone, a kind of um, stone that relates to the clench stone, which used to be um, quarried in the, in the area. And our, our other um, kind of major block type was the courtyard building in the center. And here the, the principle was that the center of the site would be a kind of oasis. And so this is a, a more informal architecture. Again, playing with the idea of, of a, a facade that kind of, um, or a skin that peels away from the volume of the building to create sort of inhabited um, spaces, bay windows and balconies, um, a, a kind of three-dimensional device also for shading the, the facade because it's south and west facing. And this is the, the kind of character of, of the street we're creating, looking through one of the gaps from the street um, into the courtyard space. So the, the kind of concept for this, um, for central Milton Keynes was, a, was the idea of a new garden city. Um, Whereas our other scheme for Milton Keynes Campbell Park, which is at the, n uh, the north, north end of Milton Keynes, is, uh-oh, um, th this is a really bad sign. <laughs> this is our other competition scheme, which is not appearing on this PowerPoint. Okay, maybe we'll skip that. <laughs> we'll go straight to um, Norway. I'll just... <laughs> Um, basically, those two projects sort of um, are ending the, well, not quite finishing the discussion of housing, but I'm going to go to our a competition scheme here that we didn't win, but um, kind of represents the break, or we were trying to make a break out of houses and housing into cultural buildings and public building. And this competition, although we didn't win, is, I think, rep uh, representative of the ambitions that we um, apply to all of our projects. Oh, sh mm. uh oh, I think it's, uh, oops, we've lost it. Oh, shoot, this is a bit of a disaster. Um, what about this CD? Oh, God. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. It was working in the office. Um, what did we do? Well, 
I mean, basically, I was going to talk about the um, Arctic Culture Center in Norway, leading on to the Folkestone Performing Arts Center, which is a competition that we won last year and um, just got planning permission about three weeks ago, but it's going to go on site in about six weeks. So, um, and then the work we're doing for, liver, um, for Urban Splash in Liverpool. So, I don't know, I think maybe we're going to have to save it for another another evening for the remainder of the lecture. I'm really sorry about this, but I don't know. Insurmountable technical problems. One last, one last. straight to the Arctic Culture Center. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I think it worked. Thanks for hanging on. This competition Oh, it's an international open competition, which is um, you really only do them if you're really interested in, in basically doing research because the chances of winning are very remote and the chances of building what you win are also really remote. But what was interesting about this competition is that it's set in Hammerfest in Norway, which is about... Um, 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle. It's the most, it's the northernmost um, city or town in all of Europe. 
And so it's subject to really extreme climatic conditions. It was um, a kind of fishing town built all in timber <coughs> and was burned to the ground at the end of the Second World War and rebuilt in the 60s. Um, so like, like Milton Keynes, the, the town has a kind of monoculture of 60s kind of low budget architecture. Um, and it's um, kind of characterized in the middle of February by these images on the left. It's completely covered in about two inches of sheet ice. And so um, walking around is really difficult. You sort of have to walk with your arms out. And um, well, there aren't, there aren't very many people walking around. Um, and the kind of figure ground plan on the right shows the structure of the existing town, kind of scattered houses and flats. And the empty site in the middle is the former sort of working harbor front, which um, had a lot of fish factories, basically, along it which the competition set as the site and is intended to be a new cultural center for the whole kind of north of um, Norway and Sweden. And so these are site photos. We actually went there, which was really um, kind of amazing. You, you really have to go to the site of your competitions, or um, I believe, or you never really understand what's happening there. But um, some of the amazing kind of contradictions in scale, the, these huge ferry boats come into the harbor every day. Um, there are small sort of kiosks selling donuts in the marketplace, which again is, is covered with, with ice. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, this amazing rock, which is um, in the distance. Like when you basically stand on the shore, you see this huge island, which is about 50 miles away, but still is really vast. This is the competition site. Again, it was formerly covered with fish factories. Um, and uh, the competition was both an urban scheme as well as a building uh, for a new dance center, uh, a theater, dance theater and film theater in for Hammerfest. And so uh, we first had to develop a strategy for the, the harbor front and and f basically find the location of our theater. And so we looked at the routes that people would take. We also had to establish the location of a pier. And, and so we set that out according to where sort of vantage points from the end of the pier and the ferry dock um, and the route. And we took a, a kind of radical decision, um, which was to leave the center of the site empty and place the Arctic Culture Center kind of at the west end of the site so that this would become a new public space for the town um, and that the center would kind of frame the new piazza. And we located our, our theaters in precisely the place on that harbor front where you could see directly out to Haja, this, this great rock which kind of symbolizes the, um, the sort of Arctic sublime weather and landscape beyond the town. And so this, this is our kind of site plan which illustrates um, this idea of the central kind of really large um, piazza which we also developed as um, underground parking so that people could um, park and sort of reach all the ends of the main street underground before emerging. And um, that and we also kind of named this the Arctic Beach, that, that this kind of piazza at the n virtually at the North Pole has to um, basically ha take on a character that both works as an Arctic um, place but is a public place at the same time. And so the, the actual ground plan of the theater, which is on the left, um, is, is kind of one of the, in a way the piazza is a sort of plinth or podium for the theater. And and we were at the same time sort of working on the, the kind of notion of the character of how the theater should be read as an artifact, as a kind of cultural artifact on this Arctic beach. And we were kind of inspired by these images of um, upturned boats that were made into houses um, after Hammerfest was burned down. People were made improvising shelters out of timber. And the idea of the ark, this sort of... Um, to build the boat in the shipyard 
and these kind of massive scale elements on on the edge of the um, on the edge of the water. And the other important or kind of crucial quality is that the sun never rises um, higher than 20 degrees above the horizon line. And so you can't kind of use conventional um, shading and daylight models. And we were concerned that the mass and volume of this building on the harbor front was going to completely overshadow the um, street beyond. And so we lifted the building up above the um, piazza to allow light to penetrate through to the sort of crescent beyond and um, gave it a kind of underbelly which is a segment of a sphere that I think is about 200 meter diameter sphere so in a way the building becomes a, a kind of a piece of a huge bowl which is hovering above the um, the town in a way at the top of the world so we're kind of making these sort of strange connections to um, larger scale ideas of, of um, landscape. Um, th it's a very simple plan. It's basically if you're building at the North Pole, you just want to limit the amount of cladding as much as possible. So it's a very tight box with the program packed in, um, three different kinds of theaters, dance school. And we took the approach that you would sort of use the ground floor of the theater as, as a kind of public space and use different kinds of stairs which would pierce the underbelly of the building to um, actually enter the theater itself. And this big ramp to the right of the um, building leads down to uh, the new a boardwalk which we proposed. So these are just studies of, of um, the underbelly, basically looking at how this, this huge sphere sort of hovering over the foyer space creates uh, different atmospheres and kind of compresses the, the horizon line or compresses the view to this wider landscape. And these are, are more finished images, the stair up to the foyer. So we're kind of completely overturning the idea of the theater with a huge open triple height space foyer with lots of mezzanines and loads of glass and, and we're really working on making a, a very um, uh, kind of enclosed container for the theater and that this is a kind of public space although it's enclosed in glass is part of um, the city itself and here um, the view to the island Hajab is, is really framed by both the stairs up to the theater and um, the structure at the same time we're exploring s the nature of the skin and working in sort of Baltic countries, it's really, um, I mean, we felt that timber might be an appropriate material, but it's really um, tough to compete against all those um, Swedes and Norwegians with their fantastic timber detailing. And, and how can we um, kind of do something that both expresses a kind of unique quality for Hammerfest and uses timber cladding in, um, as a device that deals with the environment and with the weather and kind of helps the building to um, uh, basically protect itself. And so we started um, thinking about things like polar bears and how, how the skin and the fur of a polar bear works. Um, basically the skin of a polar bear is black but the fur is white and there's a, a layer of fluff between the exterior um, the kind of fibers of the bear's skin which insulate the bear and the, the um, white color comes from camouflage and then the black skin is the heat absorbing element. And so we started thinking about how we could kind of translate this idea of how a polar bear's fur could work in architectural um, terms and these are kind of really early studies of um, arrays of timber logs and we looked at in section how logs basically projecting from the face of the building could trap snow which is the section on the left um, in winter against and then in summer when the snow melts the sun penetrates through the logs to a black skin which helps increase the kind of environmental performance of the building in a very similar way to polar bear fur which is the detail on the right and so these are kind of studies uh, 
basically of trying to sort of regularize or rationalize how an array of logs um, might work that both um, sort of cloud the building and create filters for different kinds of views and just express this quality of a kind of blanket, a kind of wrapping of, of this volume. And so um, our scheme as this kind of backdrop to the um, piazza is in a way what we felt was really appropriate for this location that if you're going to be at the North Pole, the buildings should express this um, need to enclose and create warmth. And what was kind of ironic was that the winning scheme was exactly what we didn't want to do. It, it was a completely glazed building, sort of glowing pink box with sort of triple height and quadruple height spaces and um, a, a kind of classic um, early 21st century response, but in a totally inappropriate um, context, we felt. So they, although um, we didn't win this, this scheme, we um, really were quite pleased with the kind of places it took us in terms of research. And in a way, sort of led the, paved the path for doing this competition for the new Folkestone Performing Arts Center. Folkestone is, um, for those of you who don't know, it's a quite small city on the south coast of England. I hadn't been there before the competition happened, and I don't think anybody goes there anymore because um, since the Channel Tunnel was put in, they've taken the signs for Folkestone off the motorway, so it reads, um, you know, Dover and Calais and... and uh, Ashford in the Channel Tunnel, but they've actually taken folks and off the road signs. So unless you have a really specific reason for going there, you would miss it. Um, and this is an image of Folkestone in the 19th century. It was a really um, popular, super popular resort. People used to go there to take the waters. The um, it, there may be a resurgence of this with global warming. Folkestone might become the kind of niece of England, you never know. And there's a kind of um, legacy of this, of the city's um, history as a kind of spa and 19th century resort with these really quite grand Edwardian hotels along the seaside. <coughs> and there's still the sea and the sky which was <coughs> painted by Turner at, um, again, in the last century. And amazingly enough, there's a quite a nice, um, a, a real working fishing harbor with um, real fishermen and real rock candy um, makers and um, the old main street of the town, which is, is a kind of medieval winding street. And so there's actually a lot of really nice things about the place that are kind of there because Folkestone has been sort of left behind. And so we were, this competition for the New Performing Arts Center is part of the arts-led regeneration of Folkestone, which has um, been kick-started by an organization, a charity called the Creative Foundation, which is buying up all these derelict properties throughout Folkestone, converting them and renting them out to artists. And um, the site, which is marked in yellow, is, is one of these sites on Tontine Street, which is that that street that leads down to the harbor and is now, I think, the worst street in the whole of the south of England or something for crime. It's a really terrible, um, sort of dangerous place. And all of the kind of renovation of Folkestone is moving from the west side towards the east. And this is on the kind of frontier of civilization, basically. But the ambition of the client is um, that it, it does bring um, a new kind of cultural and arts focus to um, Folkestone. So as part of the competition, although we weren't asked to do an urban scheme, we actually did one anyway because we felt that if, if this new cult public cultural building is going to kind of operate effectively and become linked to both the harbor and the rest of the town that we needed to address these connections. So we proposed um, a, a series of um, 
basically widening the street, uh, the pavements of Tontine Street, creating a tree-lined boulevard which connects it to the harbor and renovating this sort of derelict land behind the theater into a park. It's, it's in a sort of amphitheater um, that slopes down towards, towards the new building and could operate as a summer theater. And uh, probably our most convincing um, move for the client was our proposal to create a new public square in front of the theater, um, which is here. And at the moment, there's one kind of little cafe building, and the rest of that site's empty. And we, we suggested that if that piece of land could be purchased, it would make a fantastic kind of setting and context for the new theater as a both an urban place and um, and as a as a functioning theater. So this is the the view of Tontine Street from the harbor, the kind of before view, and you can see well, actually most of these places, amusement parlors and bingo clubs are sort of boarded up. And this was our proposal to create the tree-lined promenade to our theater, which is in the distance. What we didn't know at the time is that Foster's done a master plan of Folkestone. And um, he's actually proposed to completely fill in the whole um, harbor area with new um, apartments and a new harbor and this kind of key place, which is where the medieval streets converge, is completely swallowed up with new buildings. But that's okay. I'm sure it will. It'll take a while for this master plan to happen, and our building's going on site in six weeks. So we're just going to get in there first. Um, and so this is a kind of zooming in on, on the site plan, um, which shows how, again, with the theater, basically you're packing a lot of program into, well, here again, we're packing a lot of program into a very tight site. And so the, um, the theater is, is basically set back, allowing the, the street side to act as a kind of shop front and participate in the, the kind of street activity. This is a, a shot looking at the site of former builder's yard. This is the cafe on the right that we're proposing to remove. Or this builder's yard is actually buildings at the moment. And that's the site from, from this other end, Dunk Builders. <coughs> and so, uh, I mean, at the same time, we're really kind of getting into Folkestone and, and starting to discover and appreciate um, some of the sort of iconography, the seaside or oceanic kind of iconography that's already embedded in the place. There are lots of buildings that have scallop shell window details. There's the kind of trinket shop by the seashore with, um, or by the harbor with shells and ships and every possible cheesy souvenir you could find in a seaside town. But we were actually really quite inspired by this trinket box which is covered with shells and thought in a way this is this could be the kind of model or the metaphor for our building um there's some more shells the scallop shell and then also the challenge of making this building kind of express what's happening um that it has the kind of um excitement of theater land in London with the colored lights and that it can somehow express the activity within because the brief was to, um, is that it's a multi-purpose theater for rock, pop, concerts, um, conferences, weddings, everything imaginable. And of course the, the shell references and scallops, there's a whole kind of iconography and lots of myths that, that use shells in um, in the kind of stories that relate to seaside culture. So, so we had to kind of translate all of this into our building somehow. And um, we basically, because it's also a very low budget building, came up with the idea of, of using really low tech sort of sign, backlit sign technology and sort of um, cloaking the building in backlit signs which have a sort of compressed front perspex or polycarbonate cover so that the whole facade of the building becomes a series of um, scallops or is, is fluted and can be illuminated. 
and our sort of um, proposal at the competition stage was that the whole facade could be programmed with different light effects so the building itself could subtly glow or kind of um, even change light and color according to a kind of programmed um, choreography that visiting artists could um, actually design. And so this was our sort of competition image um, showing the, the new building overlooking the new proposed square and basically the the one of the main points of this project is to act as a kind of cultural focus in a new sort of living room for Folkestone and so our first floor bar um, is this kind of uh, window both into the theatre for the activity on the street and it's a window out so the building becomes a kind of balcony overlooking the square. So again, just to quickly go through the plans, it's, it's the idea of the, the front of the theatre acting as a kind of shop front, uh, ramped entrance up to into the bar and main access to the theatre itself. And then a, a balcony level in this, this area will be the new bar and cafe. And then the top floor of the building is actually a business centre. It's the Folkestone Arts and Business Centre um, as it's getting funding from from um, Shepway Council for a new startup businesses and incubator kind of um, program on the top floor of the building. So again, it's kind of really um, a, a sort of hybrid building in program. Um, unfortunately, we realized as uh, well af after we'd won the competition started developing a scheme that the polycarbonate cladding just wasn't going to stand up to the kind of abuse it would get on Tontine Street and so we had to um, come up with another material that could be both this kind of translucent um, filter that it could still act as a sort of light box but be really durable and we looked at sort of hundreds of different materials and finally arrived um, at um, expanded metal mesh, which um, I've used before in sort of early projects with Ron Arad, but also you may have seen it used by um, Howarth Tompkins on um, the Young Vic, but we didn't know that Howarth Tompkins was using it when we, when we were looking at this um, material. And we're doing it in a, in a really different way by turning it vertically. Um, it emphasizes the, the, um, the scalloped effect or the fluted effect of each one of the, um, the kind of bays in the facade and, and also emphasizes it as a kind of curtain or it could even be read as a series of columns so we developed this, um, the mesh, as, as our kind of illuminated cladding. And these are some of the kind of mock-up details and our section details, which, um, I mean, relate a little bit to what we were doing with the Arctic Culture Center. I mean, this mesh, although it's not acting as a kind of thermal performance device. It's acting as a device to kind of animate the building and activate the street. And it, and it has a kind of, um, it's about 600 mil thick, so it has the same kind of depth um, as the Arctic Culture Center building and the same kind of detailing <laughs> principles. And so these are, are sort of developed images and we, we're actually really much happier with the mesh than we are with the polycarbonate. It's um, aside from the fact that polycarbonate blows away and turns yellow, um, it's, it's actually got a combination of kind of toughness and sort of ephemeral um, qualities and three-dimensional quality that we're, we're really happy with. And this is the building at night, kind of, or in the evening, where it glows and we're developing ways of, of making the lighting um, work possibly with um, different programs and different colors, but it would even work with really basic floodlights. <coughs> and then these are studies of the interior, again, working with a really limited budget and using really simple devices um, such as um, mirrors and barisol ceilings to create an illusion of space and depth. And we've cut um, sort of oculuses in the floor to make the visual connection between 
the cafe and the foyer. When you look up from the ground floor through one of the oculuses, you'll see the, the whole um, first floor cafe reflected in the ceiling. And more developed images. The bar is conceived as a kind of um, cube of gold that's been kind of excavated from the side of the theater. <coughs> so that's what that volume is on the right. And these layouts show the different uses of the actual theater space as concert, conferences, standing room, weddings. And so we had to develop um, a kind of language for the auditorium that would enable it to kind of work for both club nights with the seats retracted and and also convey a sense of kind of elegance or um, um, kind of glamour when the seats are pulled out because we're really trying to um, avoid the sort of school hall quality. And so the, the kind of timber cladding in the bars and the foyer are reappear in the, in the um, concert hall itself. So we're sort of trying to make a really strong um, material connection between the hall and the foyers. And here's an image of, of it on a sort of club night. It looks like a high school, high school dance night. Um, so that's um, where we are with Folkestone. And what's really um, interesting about that project or is is a kind of great advantage for us is that it's going on site really quickly and and is giving us a sort of foot in the door into other competitions that we've been invited to do um, such as Corpus Christi College in Oxford and um, um, there's another competition <laughs> Um, well, this is how back to housing again and I know you've already seen a lot of housing but I think um, I just wanted to end with this project because it's at its infancy. The, the projects that you've seen so far have been more or less developed um, either very close to uh, completion or construction, whereas this project is in, is in its infancy and has kind of given us the opportunity to explore a new city, Liverpool, um, and, um, and kind of develop an, an urban strategy or an architectural strategy that it's, that's both urban, like primarily urban in its response, and is just beginning to find its kind of material expression. So Great George Street in Liverpool is this road kind of at the bottom of the slide. <coughs> and this is a really big site that's been assembled by Urban Splash, who you probably all know are um, the kind of developers of choice for the new generation of architects and everybody in the north who wants to um, reinvent their cities, their kind of post-industrial cities into kind of um, desirable places to live. And so this site is um, kind of a strange shape, but it's, it's where a lot of um, right now is either cleared land or social housing. And the idea is to really um, densify this site and create a really strong urban um, frontage and connection to the rest of Liverpool, which is off the top of the, the slide. On the right, you can see the, the kind of footprint of St. George's Cathedral, which is the um, Church of England Cathedral of, of Liverpool. And then there's some pretty bad 70s um, housing in between Great George Street and the cathedral. And at the top of the plan is a is a quite prominent sort of um, Greek neoclassical church building called the Blackie. And then it sort of bleeds off into industrial sort of wasteland beyond the site. And so this, this is the kind of um, the threshold of the site in a way. It's the intersection of Great George Street with that leads back into the center of Liverpool. This is the Blackie, and the site is basically in this void here as y um, you look down Great George Street. And so at the moment, um, most of this housing is um, actually empty, um, and, it, and it is kind of dominated by St. George's Cathedral, which is elevated on a hill to the west of the site. And we were originally invited to look at, um, well, it was called Lot 1, 
phase two, I think. Um, and I'm going to show you our sort of, basically this was a competition to, um, for Urban Splash, because they tend to invite architects to do competitions against three or four of their contemporaries. And so for this competition scheme, we um, felt it would was kind of, um, it would be interesting to kind of draw on the, the heritage of Liverpool, the kind of warehouse heritage where building the buildings have real weight and real mass and a really strong presence, which is kind of echoed in the Sir Giles Gil Gilbert Scott's Cathedral at the top of the hill. Um, however, as a kind of counterpoint to that, we were also really inspired by the stained glass in, in St. George's Cathedral, the, the kind of lightness and amazing luminous quality that um, light transferring through this colored surface gives to the building. So we basically developed a whole lot of, or looked at a whole lot of options in terms of accommodating the, the Urban Splash Brief, which was for 100 units of flats on quite a tight site and, and commercial space, and studied all of these different configurations, which the, um, the kind of typical apartment typology could take on the site. And we studied uh, several of these three-dimensionally and got kind of carried away with ideas about creating a building that's kind of wrapping a courtyard and sort of being seduced by these three-dimensional images, but um, at the same time subjecting them to tests such as shadow and daylighting um, models, which showed that it was a really bad proposition that really the building needed to be open to the west and the south and we had to negotiate this kind of change in scale from an eight-story frontage on Great George Street down to basically bungalows at the back of the site. And so the building became this kind of spiral of volumes wrapping um, a communal outdoor space. And Basically, we felt that the, the kind of color that is um, so uh, kind of amazing and kind of hidden in the cathedral could sort of jump out and, and ex uh, be expressed in this building as a kind of introduction or flagship for the new development. And the idea was that the colored um, sort of panels of colored glass on one side of bay windows would um, act as kind of um, lights or colored luminaires when you're walk, uh, walking or approaching the building from the north you would read it as this this series of colored lights whereas when you saw the building from the other end it would read as as a more conventional building with bay windows so we were kind of playing with these um, kind of references and analogies and the and Urban Splash was really happy, and we thought we'd won that competition, but instead of giving us that site to develop, which we were really keen to do as our kind of prize, we were given a different site and told to start all over again, because the site that we I just described to you is up here at the top of um, Great George Street, and but phase one is actually down here, and, they, and Urban Splash um, said, okay, now you can take on the very front of the site. The other architects involved in the scheme, Quarecraft and um, Riches Holly Mickhill, are, are also doing other buildings within this mix. And so this was a completely new challenge. We had to kind of um, kiss goodbye our earlier scheme and take on a, a completely new project in a way, which was um, to address this site sort of at the nose of Great George Street on either side of this really strong Gothic um, building called the Wedding Shop. At the moment, it's got a wedding shop in it, but it's it's this kind of lonely building, which is going to be surrounded by eight, nine, and ten-story apartment buildings. And um, on either side of it, and behind it, was our site. And so we approached this really as a as a kind of um, urban proposition more than a building and did a series of studies of what the site, the master plan conditions of the site sort of without our site, without our building and what and here 
is um, what we were supposed to build, which was a building completely um, encompassing this um, unfortunate wedding shop. But what's, what's kind of interesting is that the sort of density that Urban Splash is proposing does really start to define this, um, this intersection and this um, end of the street. And so <coughs> this is a real synopsis of some of the studies we've done, but you can see from basically these four studies, we were suggesting that it was a kind of overdevelopment of this site and that really kind of quashed this, this Victorian building. And we made a series of propositions of, of breaking the, the um, program into kind of smaller elements or sculpting them as a kind of frame or ultimately just pulling our building away from the wedding shop and, and manipulating it formally so that it's in a way more respectful and creates a kind of finer grain, a finer texture of building around, the, around this building. And so these plans sort of show that kind of evolution. And Urban Splash were open to that. They sort of said, yes, we agree. You don't need to fill up the site with our brief. You can, you can break it up into smaller elements. So then we had to, for the next phase, sort of start looking at our site as two, two buildings with the wedding shop in the middle. And we were still pretty unhappy with the um, the kind of density and overshadowing, and so we started to sort of slice and slide pieces of the of the program volumes around um, to break to break it up and provide views and different qualities of flats and allow more light into the building from different angles. And we started to think that potentially this this site could have a kind of marker quality that the Blackie at the at the north end of um, Great George Street and the tower of St. George's Cathedral um, in a way could sort of reappear at our end of the site to sort of define this this space as um, a kind of new urban territory in a way. And so this this is a really crude montage of, of basically the new volumes of the, the master plan with a kind of indication of what might happen at down at our end of the site, a kind of vertical marker. But it has to compete with, well, not compete, uh, it has to kind of defer to the St. George's Cathedral at the same time. So, I mean, there's a whole series of... Um, kind of intermediate stages, but this idea of taking the three buildings and playing with the heights so that one of them, one tower, can become not only um, a vertical marker, but is, is also has the potential to be a hotel, um, which Urban Splash are interested in. And these, this image sort of shows how we've begun to sort of sculpt the, the roof line in a way to let more sunlight into the communal courtyard and to start to express the, a kind of similarity to the, the kind of neo-Gothic buttressing of, um, of the towers of St. George's Cathedral. And here we're just at the very early stages of, of looking at how windows <laughs> could work in the in within these forms. And uh, really these were just to introduce this concept to Urban Splash and they were, they were really, really keen and they really want us to do quite a tall tower now. So this is, um, this is basically where the scheme was um, taken to just as of about a week and a half ago. And, and at the moment we're basically writing a brief and defining the sort of master plan controls um, for these three towers and potentially doing one that's, that's quite significantly taller. So this is where I'm going to sort of end the lecture and I hope it gives a, an idea of um, our approach and how we, we attempt to respond to the um, briefs that we get both at an urban level but really develop a quite specific and intense identity for each scheme. Um, we have yet to see where this one goes but um, that kind of concludes the lecture and hopefully in a, 
in a year, so there'll be some finished projects to show. Thank you. <clears throat>